Good morning, everybody. I think it's that time. I think the I don't I didn't hear the bell, but I do believe it is about that time. So we're going to get started this morning, and appreciate you being here today. Uh, thankful for the. I think we're supposed to get a little rain today, so that'll be good. Kind of get everything kind of watered down a little bit. The two requests that I have is uh, Tom Rep is still under the weather, so want to keep him in prayer. And then the Sansonetti family as well uh, needing prayer. And so <clears throat> so uh, want to pray for those. Any other prayer requests that I'm not aware of? <clears throat> yes, Jennifer? Uh, All right. Dana? Physical need? No, she will be traveling as well from Illinois, but they will be driving separate cars. Oh, okay. All right. So pray for John and Dana as they're traveling tomorrow. Uh, did I see another hand, Miss Phyllis? Yeah, uh, Lynn is not alive. She's a friend of ours and she's really bad. Oh, okay. Physical need, I would take it, right? Yeah. Lynn Stottlemyer, so keep that in. Prayer, physical need there. Any other prayer request? All right. How about blessings this week? Anything good happen to anybody? Yes, sir. Brother Tom. I, uh, I didn't you did? Woo! Uh, that... Wonderful. Well, does that change your hours now? Well, that's all right then. We can work with that. Well, that is an answer to prayer, and uh, we're thankful for that. Well, look at here. Lana. No, you're still here. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Good to see Lana back. Uh, any other prayer requests or blessings? Yes, sir. Way in the back. Donald? Right. All right, let's continue to pray for Donald Murphy then, the procedure that they may be doing. Anybody else? All right, well then, uh, let's look at the bulletin. We got a lot of things that we need to go over this uh, in the bulletin because of these things happening. Of course, this coming Tuesday night will be our Thanksgiving service. Remember, there is no dinner uh, we've had to cancel the dinner because of the COVID situation, but we will be meeting here in the auditorium Tuesday night, seven o'clock, and uh, we'll have the uh, the like we would have upstairs. We'll have testimonies. Uh, we'll have uh, young people or anybody who would like to be involved in either playing an instrument or singing or doing something special. Uh, please see Barry about that. And then of uh, my son-in-law, uh, Pastor Nance from down in Florida, will be here to, to bring the, the challenge. And that will replace our Wednesday night service so that folks can enjoy their holiday. So uh, please be here on Tuesday night. And that will be again at 7 o'clock. Remember that, 7 o'clock, all right? Full board meeting is a week from tomorrow at uh, 7 o'clock as well. And so men, please make sure you notice that. And if you cannot be there, please let me know. Uh, also, Ironman's Breakfast and the Season Saints for December has been canceled because of the COVID situation right now. They don't uh, recommend that anybody get together and do those things. And so we're trying to make sure that our people are safe. And so please make sure of that. But we will have uh, family prayer time, and that'll always be on the first Sunday night, of, or Saturday night, excuse me, of the month. So that'll be December the 5th, and that'll be at seven or 6 o'clock here in the church. Above Ruby's Christmas uh, meeting is still going on. Uh, that'll be Tuesday, December the 8th, ladies, so make note of that. Uh, the theme is my favorite thing, so they're asking you to bring a $5 gift to exchange and wrap that, so it'll be kind of the idea of the 
uh, Chinese auction, possibly. I, I believe that would be it. So uh, please look at that and keep that in mind. And then the Widow's Christmas Luncheon. Uh, we are planning to have that still because uh, we can still meet at restaurants. They'll have to separate up a little bit. There'll be uh, no more than six at a table, but we'll be close. We've already talked with the diner uh, so that we can stay in those guidelines. And so uh, that'll be at the Hagerstown Family Diner out on Dual Highway. That'll be Tuesday, December the 1st. So uh, make note of that if, it, uh, if you are affected by that. And then the children's Christmas program uh, this year is because of the gathering. We're trying to give our young people something that'll be at least a little bit memorable. And so it's going to be held at our home. And uh, that'll be on December the 5th, Saturday, December the 5th, from 1 to 3. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, if you have any young person in those areas, uh, just let them know there will be transportation available. Uh, and I guess that would be a meet at the church and then we'll take a van or something of that nature. All right. So anyway, that's there. Uh, then uh, the Christmas program is going to be held on Saturday or Sunday, December the 13th on the morning service here. Uh, they are working on that. The, the times of practices are in there in the bulletin. And if you have someone uh, that is involved in that, please make sure that they're able to make it to the uh, practices so that they can prepare. Uh, I know we have several folks that are <coughs> out of town. Lynn and Sharon Munson are preaching uh, out today, so keep them in prayer, if you will. I know they would appreciate the prayers for as Brother Lynn uh, uh, fills in in the church. And then uh, the Mersons are uh, down in Florida, and so uh, with family uh, for the holidays, so uh, please keep them in prayer as well. Uh, any other prayer request or blessing that I did not get earlier? All right, good. I guess that covers everything then. And uh, let's go to the Song of Solomon. And does anybody need a lesson outline? All right. Do you have one? Okay. One or two? One? Uh huh, thank you. Anybody else? All right. You need one, Randy? Okay. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else? We were uh, into this lesson last week, and uh, when we got to uh, the first big point, letter B there, I found that I did not have all of the information. And so I went back and did some studying this uh, past week. And let me give you those uh, last few points. Uh, I think we got one through four. Is that right? All right. So number five. And we now remember, here we have the, we have the uh, uh, shepherd now has kind of stolen in. Uh, one of the commentaries that I uh, read states that this was maybe a dream that the Shulamite was having. Uh, she was uh, captive there uh, by Solomon and, uh, of course, thinking about her sh uh, shepherd, uh, wanting to have that relationship again reestablished. Uh, one of them suggested that this was a kind of a dream that she was having. And uh, as they were dreaming, the shepherd was making these comments. Uh, but whether it was a dream or in reality, let me just say, uh, when we get to heaven, we'll find out for sure. But uh, I think the first four that I had there uh, under that were her mystery, her majesty, her magnificence, 
and her mouth. These are the things that the shepherd, as he was again captivated by her presence, these are the things that he was kind of sharing with her, uh, letting her know that uh, this was uh, his love uh, for him. Number five, he noticed her modesty. As uh, Let's look at that in chapter four. Chapter 4, uh, and uh, let's see here, let me, uh, verse number 3, it says, Thy temples are like a piece of uh, a pomegranate within thy locks. If you look at a pomegranate, uh, it's, uh, if you cut one, it is red on the inside. And I think what this signified was he, she, he was viewing her and possibly through the veil and uh, the area that uh, would be exposed, um, possibly because he was talking about her majesty. He had talked about her magnificence, talked about how her mouth looked and the things that there. She possibly could have blushed. A little bit, and that, of course, would have turned uh, her uh, cheeks and things kind of a reddish tint. And so, possibly, he was noticing that she was uh, very modest in her opinion of herself. She wasn't bold, she wasn't brash. She was very refined, and as he was complimenting her on things that he noticed, it possibly could have embarrassed her a little bit, and so she was just modest. And, and boy, I'll tell you what, uh, in this day and age, uh, modesty has uh, kind of gone out the window, hasn't it? And uh, I think there's nothing wrong with a, a lady or a man uh, being modest in, in what their opinion of themselves uh, or uh, what uh, uh, their uh, actions and attitudes. So uh, he noticed that, and that was one of the points that he wanted to point out that had drawn him, I think, of initially, uh, of course, to this Shulamite. Then in uh, the next thing, uh, in verse number four, we find that he uh, mentions number six, her might. Notice it says that uh, thy neck is like the tower of David builded for an armory uh, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Uh, <coughs> back in biblical days, marriages were arranged by the parents. And uh, as the parents would get together with the prospective bride and groom, uh, and they would discuss uh, the terms of the, uh, uh, the arrangement. And once it was agreed upon, then the groom uh, would uh, give a betrothal gift to the uh, bride, a prospective bride, uh, which she would wear. Uh, today we do the same thing. When a man asks a lady to, to become his wife, uh, they give an engagement ring, and she wears that as a sign that she has given herself uh, perspectively or, or uh, uh, along the way uh, to a, a certain person. And so uh, back in those days, though, they didn't necessarily uh, have the rings, but they had the golden uh, little coins uh, on a, on a uh, headpiece that they would wear. And uh, those, as they would hang down, if you'll notice that uh, that passage in verse number four, it says, uh, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers or shields of mighty men and kind of gave that appearance to it, that she had uh, this strength about her. She was uh, one who uh, knew what she wanted. She had resisted the uh, temptations, the uh, wooing of uh, the, the world or Solomon, and she had kept herself uh, for him. So she, she demonstrated that she had given her life over to him and in her might had restrained herself. And then number seven, in verse number five, we find that he noticed her majesty, or excuse me, her maturity, her maturity. Uh, it says, until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get thee to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. And so uh, we realize that uh, this was a time that the uh, uh, 
the attitude would be there. Oh, excuse me. I read the wrong verse. Number five, it says, thy two breasts are like the young rose that are twins, which feed among the lilies. And uh, uh, he described her as being, of course, a fully matured woman. Uh, it takes time to grow. It takes time to mature. Beauty is something that if you plant a flower today, tomorrow you walk out and it's not fully grown. It's not fully displaying the beauty, the potential it has. It takes time for that thing to root itself and to grow and then to display the beauty that it has. And this is what he found is that over the time, she had constantly matured herself into a woman that uh, displayed a, a sense of not necessarily all physical beauty, but spiritual beauty and uh, uh, spiritual maturity. And so uh, that's more important, really, than anything else. You know, today, unfortunately, we're caught up with this idea of physical beauty. Aren't we? You watch the TV. How many times do you see commercials about people buying cream to take out wrinkles or, or uh, you know, take this medicine and it'll make you powerful again and young again and, and all the rest. And we, we do all these things to try to keep our youth and look good and beauty and hair products. You know, you got to use the right shampoo so that your hair will gleam and shine and you got to use the right uh, uh, toothpaste so your teeth will be uh, sparkling white. And, and we want to have this attachment and there's nothing wrong with doing the best we can with what we have. But the fact is, uh, spiritual beauty is more important than outward beauty. Because outward beauty is going to fade. No matter what you do, uh, it's not going to last. Amen. Uh, but spiritual beauty what really makes us what we ought to be. And that's what he's noticing here is that her, as she's matured physically, she's also matured spiritually. And she's become that which has affected him and caught his attention. So I wanted to catch you up on those. And I apologize. I didn't have those originally. Amen. But we did get them. All right. Number two then on your outline. Here we find the passionate response of the Shulamite. Look at verse number six. It says, until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountains of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Uh, there are two great focal points here that uh, express the response, I think, of the Shulamite. Did I cover this last week? Did I? Okay. How far did I get? Oh, I got down to number three? Okay, well, I apologize then. All right, well, then let's start at number three then. All right, I didn't mark my uh, notes here. All right, so here we find the pilgrim responsibility of the Shulamite. In verses 7 through 15, let's read those together. Says, Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon, look from uh, the top of uh, Amana, and from the top of Shinar, and uh, Hermon, and from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with the chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is my, thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is uh, like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchid of pomegranates the, with pleasant fruits, camphor and spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, and all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. So here we find now the response 
of the Shulamite. The shepherd was fully aware of the dangers that surrounded his beloved. And remember now, she's still in captivity. She's still being held by Solomon, who is still trying to woo her to get her affections. And so he realizes that there is still uh, danger there. He was concerned that she might be worn down, eventually, of course, succumb to the seductive uh, attack uh, of Solomon himself. And so uh, she must not forget her shepherd. She has to keep her mind on the shepherd. Let me tell you something. You know, the thing today is that we are overwhelmed if we're not careful by the world. Isn't that true? <coughs> the world's news, uh, the situation we face, if we're not careful with the virus and the regulations and the things that we are facing today, if we are not careful, we can become discouraged. We can become spiritually defeated. And so we have to only recourse is that we must keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to... Uh, <coughs> Remember that he is still in charge. Solomon, of course, would indeed attempt to frighten and to flatter her. He's going to do whatever it takes to win and to defeat her resistance. And so does the world with us today. Uh, uh, fights us, uh, does everything, frightens us. How many people are so frightened over the virus that it keeps them from coming to church? Amen? Uh, or doing what they ought to. I mean, I realize that there is danger. I realize that there is. But you know what? I still know that God's in charge. And uh, he is still the one that is ultimately uh, going to defend us and to protect us. So uh, he hears, here uh, the uh, shepherd wants to protect and to encourage uh, this Shulamite. She has to hold fast in her heart and in her mind and in her will uh, to that beloved one. And so that's what we have to. That's why church is important. That's why staying in your Bible is important. That's why prayer is important during this time, especially because we have to stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to keep resisting and fighting the, the things that surround us and encourage us. Uh, I haven't checked on this yet fully. I'm trying to figure out. I have a, uh, in my uh, son-in-law's church, there's a, uh, a lady who's a doctor, and I'm trying to get a hold of her. But uh, this new vaccine that's coming out, that's 95% uh, effective. In that vaccine, uh, uh, when we were out last Sunday with uh, the Stroops, Mrs. Stroops, an, uh, a nurse, and uh, this is where the conversation started. She says, and I don't know it, I'm just putting it out, that in this vaccine, there is some kind of a marker that has been placed in it. That when you take the vaccine, that marker stays in your body. And that marker uh, will determine whether or not... Uh, when all of this is through, when you go to the airport to fly, uh, they'll check to see if that marker, you can get on an airplane and fly. Uh, if you go to certain places, uh, maybe sports uh, opens up again and you want to go to watch the ball game or whatever it is, uh, somehow they'll check this marker to see. Now, it kind of sounds to me like it could be a precursor to what we know in the book of Revelation as the mark of the beast. Now, don't, again, I'm just putting it out there, so just wait until I kind of try to do some studying on this and see if I can get some more information. But what I am saying, it, people want the vaccine to get away from the virus, so don't they? I mean, 95% effective, boy, uh, we need that so we can go back out and kind of get rid of the mask and we can start having normal things again in our lives. And, but if it becomes that which 
Eventually, wouldn't it be horrible if you couldn't go to the grocery store if you didn't have the vaccine to buy or to sell? Exactly. Yeah, you, you, they could uh, have, that could be a marker that would determine if you could go back to work or not. And so what I am saying is it sounds really good and uh, the devil tries and Satan will try to make things. And, you know, we don't know how this mark of the beast is going to be. We really don't. I know it says in the forehead or the hand. But the fact is, is maybe that's where that marker is going to stay. And that's how they can check. I don't know if it is that. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying the potential is there when we see that. People are going to willingly get the mark of the beast so that they can buy, that they can sell, that they can uh, get back to a normal uh, set of lives. There's going to be that welcoming of that. And so we need to be aware. We need to be very cautious of it. And according to Mrs. Stroop, uh, she was saying that uh, there's a lot of the nurses that work at the hospital where she works that... Uh, uh, aren't even though health care workers are going to be the first ones to get this because they work with the COVID patients. Uh, there's a group of those nurses there that are not wanting to take it because they're concerned about the marker. So I'm trying to find out some information on it. And if I find out anything else, I'll, I'll pass it out. But that's just what I'm saying is, is we need to be aware. Uh, it's amazing to me. When we went to buy some uh, plates and things that we needed to have for the church, and we went to Sam's, I didn't know this because now I live in West Virginia, but the governor of Maryland stated that now you can't uh, buy styrofoam anything in Maryland. Uh, so we drove up to uh, Carlisle, I think it was, or someplace up there, uh, to the next Sam's in, in uh, Pennsylvania and bought all the stuff. But when we got there, there was a line like we used to have out at the Sam's. You know, you had to go stand in line. They only let so many in. And so we were standing in line, went to the line. as You know, just automatically you go stand in line and had our mask on. And all of these people were coming out of the Sam's, but nobody was going in. And the lady behind us said, you know, we're so programmed today. Do you think that we just saw the line and we just went and stood in the line and we really don't need to stand in the line? And so she went up to ask and they said, no, no, you, you have to stand there. But what I'm saying is we have become so, uh, yeah, yeah, complacent. You know, we got to have a mask on if you go into a store. You got to have that social distancing. A lot of places you got to stand in line. Uh, how many times have you gone in the store and so they've all got hand sanitizer and the first thing you do is you hit the hand sanitizer and then on the way out you hit the hand sanitizer to go back out. I mean, we've become so programmed that it, it's the normal thing that we do and we don't think anything of it. Well, we need to be careful. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm not saying wearing a mask right now is wrong or the hand sanitizer. I'm just saying that we need to be very careful that as things come down, because maybe we're being already programmed that when this things start to move, we as Christians will raise our hand and say, ah, that's fine. That sounds really good. But we need to be very careful that we uh, make sure that what we're doing is right. But anyway, uh, I didn't mean to digress off of this, but I just said, this is what the, the, the shepherd is saying to the Shulamite. You know, yes, you've been, uh, war you're being worn down by all the advances and the fear and the fright and the, and the blessings that, uh, the flattery. And so uh, you need to stay focused on the Lord. That's why right now I believe that it is the most important time, uh, and yet our churches are becoming 
complacent. We're becoming apathetic. But this is the time when Christians really need to stay focused and close to the Lord Jesus Christ, more so maybe than any other time. Satan's chief weapons against the church are the same that uh, Solomon uh, is using here, and that is fear and flattery. And uh, we need to understand that. Everything here in this world is temporal. The great desire of our shepherd is to get us alone and to remind us that these things are temporal and the things that are important, uh, those are eternal. And so in this passage, the shepherd now speaks to the Shulamite about five things. And these are the same things that we must allow the shepherd, uh, the, sh the shepherd, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to remind us of. All right. So number uh, letter A. He reminds her of her person. Look at verse number seven. It says, thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. The shepherd looks at his beloved through the eyes of love. And uh, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ looks at us. He only saw the spotless beauty, the spotless perfection of the Lord or of his love. One characteristic of love is that we only see the good in the one that we love, isn't it? Uh, that's, uh, and we often say that love is blind. We don't see the failures of uh, personalities or uh, problems or anything else. Because when you're in love, you're in love and there's no problem. Amen. Well, this is what he is looking at. And I'm glad. I'm glad that when the Lord Jesus Christ, because he loves me so much, he doesn't overlook sin, but he loves me in spite of that. And he cares about me all the way. The truth is that of true love is that we look beyond those faults and only see the good and the beauty of the one that we love. And uh, that's how the Christians are to love certainly one another. Let me tell you something. We're not perfect people. You look at me and you're going to find areas that you maybe already have that you uh, don't like, uh, that you don't agree with. Uh, and I can look out and probably think of things that maybe bother me about certain folk. But you know what? As Christ loves us, that's how we're to love others. And we are to care for them and to encourage them. And certainly we ought to look through those eyes of real love. That's how the Lord loves us uh, and the church that he died for. So he looks at her person. He sees only the good, only the beauty, only the wonderful things uh, that he uh, knows about his sh uh, Shulamite. Then secondly, in the letter B, he notices her position. Look at verse number eight. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Uh, look from the top of Amana and from the top of Shinar, Shinar and Hermon and the lion's den and from the mountains of the leopard. So he notices <coughs> her position here. <clears throat> the shepherd realizes maybe even more than the Shulamite of the dangerous position that she's in. Uh, <clears throat> I think sometimes we get blinded by the world. We, we realize we are in this world uh, and uh, therefore we uh, kind of have to kind of, uh, uh, we might oppose it, but we'll also have to adapt to it. Uh, certain things in our lives. Uh, uh, if you want to watch TV, you're going to have to, let down some guard and, and open yourself up to things of the world that are put through the television. Uh, if you listen to music, there's some certain things in there that would probably be offensive. Uh, but if you're going to listen to music, you might have to let down some standards. And so we have to be careful. Uh, the Lord realizes as he looks down upon this world, he sees the danger. He sees the problem. But we not always see those problems. <clears throat> and so it goes on. For, the, for this time now, remember the Shulamite, she's a prisoner. And she can't escape from her surroundings. However, even Solomon cannot control her thoughts. 
He cannot force her to bestow her affections where she does not wish to. And that's true. Yes, we live in a wicked world, but the world cannot control our devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot control how we look at sin. It can't control how we're burdened over sin and our devotion to the Lord. And so we need to, to make sure that we stay steadfast, unmovable in what we know to be truth. Here the shepherd now speaks to her about two aspects of her present position that she needed to be carefully considering. Number one, the peaks to be climbed by faith. He wanted her to look beyond her <clears throat> present position and by faith plant her feet on higher ground above the cares and the trials of life. Wanted to keep her eyes fixed upon it. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are already seated in the heavenlies, according to the book of Ephesians, seated in the heavenlies. So, what I need to do is to not look so much at this world and look at the things of this world, because let's face it, that some of the things of this world can be attractive, can be pleasing to the flesh, not necessarily good, but pleasing. And so I need to keep my eyes not fixed upon this, but I need to keep my eyes fixed upon the one thing above all the rest of this. And that's what he's saying to her. Don't look at your situation. Yes, you're captive. Yes, you can't escape. Yes, he's trying to flatter you. Yes, he's put fear. Yes, all these things are going on right now. But don't look at this. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Look above. Look at those heights that you can climb. And uh, that's what we're supposed to do is look beyond it. This is the same thing that our Lord wants us to do while we're here in this world, in this evil present world, is that by faith to climb to the heights of glory where he re resides. And that's what we need. Now, look at the significant names that are mentioned here. First of all, we find that there is this, uh, uh, let me get back to my, my passage here, uh, Look at it, it says uh, Lebanon. And that means uh, uh, whiteness. Lebanon, the name of it means whiteness. This, is the, this was the name given to the snow-capped heights of Hermon that stand out in brightness of the blue sky. Uh, this was a place of purity, just like heaven is. And so come with me from Lebanon. And then he also talks about Amana. Letter B, and that name means uh, constancy or integrity or truth. The name also suggests a covenant, something that is consistent. He wanted her to think of a place where all is the same, never changing and continuous. And aren't you glad that's what heaven is? There is no variableness. There's no, uh, this, there's no end to it. It is constant. It is continuing. And so look with me beyond this to the place that never changes. And that's what he's talking about when he talks about a manna. Then he talks about a uh, shiner. And that is to bear the lamp is what that means. This was the Amorite name for Mount Hermon. Her shepherd was reminding her that she was to stand firm and resolute, shining forth her true love and devotion to what she really loved. So even in this time, even in all the problems of the wickedness, we still need to stand true, stand strong and resolute and firm uh, for our true love, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be influenced by the world, but we are to give ourselves over completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then letter D, he talks about Herman. And that word, uh, Herman means devoted. Mount Herman is the highest of all the mountains in or around the Holy Land. And so she was to rise above her situation and to be totally committed to the shepherd. Rising above all of the problems and being totally committed 
to the shepherd. Let me ask you, if we went to the book of Revelation, and I, again, forget what I said before, I'm not talking about the vaccine, but I am talking about when people are approached and said, you must take that mark of the beast in your hand or your forehead if you want to buy, sell, uh, get a job, have a job, work, whatever it is. Think about the decision that has to be made by each and every individual. For the world, there will be no problem. They'll take it because they have no recourse as far as their own thought is that if I want to have a job, earn money and buy and sell and whatever and live and protect my family, I need to have that mark. But for the Christian, there's going to be a real decision that has to be made. Am I going to stay true to the Lord and understand that I need to give myself holy, solely devoted to him and reject this and then to trust him to meet my need above and everything else? Or am I going to succumb to the world's pressure? And isn't that what is focused on us all the time? When we are uh, out in this world with the changes and the wickedness and the evil that this world puts out, don't we have to truly always make a decision? Am I going to give in, yield to the world and to the things of the world? Or am I going to stay totally devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and resist the things that the world is offering? Every day we have that. And so we need to get to the place, that's what the, the shepherd is trying to get her to understand, that he's supposedly her true love. Solomon is the world trying to pull her affections away from him, doing everything he can to capture her heart and, and uh, all the rest, allegiance. And so she has to make a decision, is she going to stay totally devoted to the one that she loves as he has stayed devoted to her. Uh, that's the decision we all have to make each and every day as we live in this world. Uh, I heard that bell and the next one's going to ring. And so uh, we'll hold it right there and we'll start at that point uh, next Sunday. So... Uh, By the way, this week is Thanksgiving, and I hope that everybody is ready for a good week of, of celebration and holidays, even though I know it's a little different this year. I uh, trust that uh, you'll make the best of it. Amen. And uh, hope that uh, we'll all have a great, great day of fellowship. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you today again for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, certainly as that shepherd... Uh, was concerned about the, the, the determination, the steadfastness of the Shulamite and all that she was facing. Lord, I realize you're concerned about us today. Your desire is that we focus not on this world, but on the things that are above it. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay faithful, help us to stay uh, true, and uh, Lord, in the days that we live, even as we face uh, the uncertainty of, of what might lie ahead, Lord, we know that you're still in charge. And so we thank you, we praise you, and we want you to know we love you, and we're thankful that you love us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.